Hello, uh, and a very warm welcome to everyone. I am Jet Aguilar from the Astronomical League of the Philippines, and I will be your host for today's ALP, Global Astronomy Month 2023 program. Thank you so much for joining us for our online talks today. We have two esteemed expert speakers from the Astronomical League of the Philippines who have very graciously agreed to share their knowledge and experience with us. For those who were not able to register, but would still want to watch this ongoing webinar, we are currently live streaming on Facebook at the Facebook page of the Philippine Astronomy Forum. Before we start, kindly allow me to explain some rules for this webinar to help us make this an enjoyable learning experience for everyone. Please listen and do your best to give your undivided attention to our speakers. There will be a short question and answer session at the end of the lecture. You may type in your questions under the Q&A tab found in your Zoom interface at any point during the presentation. We will do our best to read and answer your questions live after the lecture or via the Q&A tab. We would like to remind everyone that the contents presented in this webinar will remain as the individual property of the lecturer and the photographers in the presentation. We will also be distributing certificates of attendance via email to all registered attendees who will be present with us throughout the webinar. So please use the name you have written in your registration forms to help us facilitate this process. Enjoy the webinar and let us all have fun learning. Here's the program flow for today's webinar. I would like to turn you over now to Mr. James Kevin T, the President of the Astronomical League of the Philippines to give his welcome remarks. Uh, greetings to all. I would like to welcome all of our attendees and distinguished guest speakers as the Astronomical League of the Philippines celebrates the Global Astronomy Month 2023. ALP has been celebrating the annual observance of the Global Astronomy Month since its inception in 2009. So it is in my great honor to welcome Mr. Ruel Norman Marigsa Astronomy Without Borders and Global Astronomy Month National Coordinator for the Philippines, who will give the opening, remar opening remarks to start the ALP GAM Astro webinar. So I'd like to welcome Norman Marixa. Good evening, everyone. So welcome to the Global Astronomy Month celebration. So the month of April is annually celebrated as the Global Astronomy Month, wherein uh, people and different organizations from around the world come together to share the different activities that they have to celebrate astronomy and of course, to bring the people closer to the, to the practice of astronomy. So the Global Astronomy Month began after the International Year of Astronomy in 2009. So, among the cornerstone projects, among the 11 cornerstone projects of the International Year of Astronomy was the 100 Hours of Astronomy. And the chair of this one was Mike Simmons, the founder of Astronomers Without Borders. And he was, uh, he together with members of the Sidewalk Astronomers uh, decided to come up with a follow-up program basically to, to continue the celebration of uh, the success of the 100 years of uh, 100 hours of astronomy and of the International Year of Astronomy 2009. So with that, with that point, they conceptualized having the Global Astronomy Month. Initially, it wasn't even a month. They wanted to do uh, just a week celebration, but they wanted to expand it some more given how many particip participants uh, joined in during the 100 hours of astronomy. And this kind of went on and the program continued to evolve, having active participation with different uh, organizations throughout uh, the world. So among even 
in, from the Philippines, we also have active members who uh, took uh, part in this annual celebration. Uh, for example, we have uh, Raven Yu, who was from the UP Astronomical Society and also as a member uh, participating in the Astronomical League of the Philippines. Uh, she was one of the executive committees who handled the Global Astronomy Month uh, blog in the past. So with this, the goal of the Global Astronomy Month is, is similar to how we celebrated the International Year of Astronomy, in which everyone gets to uh, come together and showcase how they each participate, how they each are involved in the grand scale of uh, doing astronomy, not just doing outreach, but also uh, how different uh, disciplines also look at astronomy. So like, for example, we have our astro arts, uh, how our astro poetry uh, blog continued to expand, how we've continued to look at different uh, disciplines as well. So that's why uh, the way we are celebrating uh, Global Astronomy Month nowadays is that we're focused on uh, four main themes rather than having a central theme in which uh, we did this in a manner of speaking so that many other participants can basically come together and do their own way of uh, celebrating astronomy. So our four main themes, we have inclusion, global connections, accessibility, and ethnoculture. So these are the four uh, teams in which we concentrate when we come when it comes to global astronomy month and beyond that we also have our partner programs which we continue to celebrate every year so we have the international dark sky week we have the globe at night we also have the international asteroid search campaign so this and many other more many uh, many programs uh, as well as the observing events that we have and the different involvements that we also have with uh, other groups and other parties that come together. So whenever we do these kinds of global events, this is a chance not just for us to do our own activities in our own uh, corner of the world, but this basically a chance for us to share with the rest of the global community what is it exactly that we do. So as James has mentioned that uh, ALP has also been part of the annual celebration of Global Astronomy Month since inception. And this is partly, uh, you can actually see this in when you look at through the member reports that have been shared to uh, AWB, we're in, you see the involvement that uh, all the groups uh, come together and share what, what they do. So it's not just about being able to do astronomy in your own corner of the world, which is would, would also be good uh, if you're doing outreach. We want you to share this, share this with the, gen the global community because this is what makes it an international effort basically, is that we all come together to share the wonders of astronomy, come together to let people know, show our representation about uh, how widespread is astronomy, how much of uh, how much we are reaching basically in our communities, in our, in our own country, and how we can also come together as one people in celebrating our night sky. So with that, I turn back the floor to Jet or James. Thank you so much, Norman, uh, for that uh, very comprehensive uh, explanation on what is, what is Global Astronomy Month and why are we celebrating Global Astronomy Month. So let us all celebrate uh, and enjoy Global Astronomy Month uh, this April. Thank you, Norman. Now, James, uh, would you like, uh, can I turn over now to James to introduce uh, one our first uh, esteemed speaker for tonight? Uh, thank you, Jet, for, the, for me to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is no other than uh, Raymond Sarmiento. Raymond Sarmiento is a senior vice president and a chief technical officer of GMA New Media, the technology arm of GMA Network. Serving as a CTO of the GMA New Media for the last 20 years, he is also a co-inventor of some of the research and development projects for the organization. 
with patents obtained and applied locally and abroad. He has extensive experience in AI and robotics, recently creating uh, the from scratch a Rubik Cube solver robot. Yeah. He's also an amateur astronomer. He also is a member of the Astronomical League of the Philippines for many years already. He is also he also developed a telescope observatory automation algorithm called EQ mode, which he will be discussing with us today, tonight, which he launched as an open source project in 2006. It remains active to this day. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Raymond to give us the lecture. Thank you. Okay, thank you, James. <clears throat> Allow me first to share my slide. Can you see the slide now? Yes, uh, yes. Raymond. Okay. You can see it. Okay. Um, hello and good evening. My name is Mon Sarmiento. I'm one of the founders of the developers of Ikimod. <laughs> um, for the next uh, few slides, I'm sure it's just a few slides, <laughs> I will be explaining with what Ikimod is all about and how it become very popular among uh, amateur uh, astronomers worldwide. So, okay, uh, Ikimod in a nutshell. So, basically, it's a suite of applications to aid the amateur astronomer in carrying out a specific astronomy related task in the field. Like, for example, if you're doing observation, <clears throat> so I wrote code for basically to for uh, telescope tracking, uh, for astrophotography. Uh, we also, I also wrote code for specifically for the pulse guiding part of Ikimod, where, where in you use. Instead of using ST4, that's the common uh, interface for auto guiding, uh, used uh, coded uh, a function called Pulse Guide. That is a purely software, so you don't have to use a, a cable, ST4 cable, to for the auto guiding process. And then Ikimot is, is also used for educational demonstrations because basically Ikimot can do go tos. So I coded from scratch a go to plan. Uh, uh, go to platform that can actually rotate all those stepper motors on a German equatorial mount and basically spe uh, specify the specific step count for us to be able to uh, to point the scope to the uh, in then uh, to the intended target. I also wrote code for Ikimod, basically used for satellite tracking. Later, I will show you a uh, demonstration on that. And then I also wrote code for asteroid and comet tracking using a pheromel data. So that basically you feed those data, the tracking data, and Ikimod will basically uh, control the mount. And then it will uh, try to rotate the uh, both stepper motors, the right ascension and declination to, to, the, to the correct speed that will be able to track the uh, asteroid or the comet. And then Ikimod, I also wrote code for Ikimod that's basically used for observatory automation. So some of those details I'll show you later. So what is Ikimod in a nutshell? It was established for uh, fourth quarter of 2006. So that was the time I wrote the code. So why did I wrote that code for, because at that time I was, I have this, uh, uh, German equatorial mount called the Orion Atlas, which has only has the hand controller, but the hand controller itself has uh, basically the go-to. Uh, there's no there's limited function, so I want to extend that functionality to, to the use of coding and to the use to the use of a more powerful uh, hardware laptop, for example. So. Initially, it named it Ikimod from the term equatorial modification. So it's kind of a funky na a name for it. So that was the only time I, you know, uh, think of a word equatorial modification. So that the, the name Ikimod was born. So during that time, I published the code. And in initial, initially, it, it was adapted in France because I uh, was. The time when the time I published that I 
posted it on the uh, EQ6 Yahoo groups, different Yahoo groups. So it's a common uh, amateur astronomers Yahoo group. So I made the announcement. I made the code that you can interface your mount to a computer. So that was the time. So the the people there actually were uh, uh, enthusiastic, enthusiastic in terms of oh, it's it's a, it's a new um, uh, form of control. So basically, from a hand and controller to a laptop. So guys from France, they're the ones who initially adopted it, they tested it. And then from there on with more than uh, 5,000 community members. This 5,000 actually, that was the, in the year 2011. So that was a couple of years after that initial publication during the uh, 2006. So these are members consist of observator, observatory operators with German equatorial months and high-end telescopes. So they used EQMOD for their automation. So now, why did I came up with that idea, concept of EQMOD? So at that time, basically, I was looking for more options for increasing the capability of my German equatorial mount, German equatorial mount, which is the Orion Atlas. So it's a Skywatcher EQ6 compatible mount, which has its own uh, hand controller. So it was initially limited by the basic functionalities of the hand controller, which does the standard tracking, one, two, three star alignment, and basic go-tos. And auto-guiding is ST4 based. So there's no periodic error correction. So I, attempt, I attempted to code everything what's in the hand controller, including the math behind the one star, two star, and three star pointing model using DIY math. Later, I will show you the details of that. So here's the initial UI. So I'm I'm no UI designer, but basically <laughs> I chose red because uh, James told me at that time that you, when you're in the field, the dark sky, you, you should use red light for you to be able to uh, let your eyes adjust on the interface. And then remember, since I'm using a separate uh, application that is PC based. So I need to find a way to interface that PC to the German equatorial mount. So I came up with a schematic diagram that is supposed to connect the German, the gem, the German equatorial mount to a laptop via serial and USB, USB ports. And I made and wrote that, that schematic diagram and made it public. So it didn't take long before and one guy by the name of Doe Anderson of Shoestring Astronomy, it's a US-based uh, uh, astronomy shop that took notice and asked me if he can mass produce that interface. So that's where EQDIR, EQDirect was born. So from here, you can see EQDIR. That's basically the first interface uh, option for that mount to a computer. So I released this. So basically, the idea here is people will just buy the dongle, which is this download EQ mod and you're good to go. So a PC-based control on your German equatorial mount. So EQMOD is not just a standard alone control, uh, telescope control software. So I made sure that it will, it will work side by side with other astronomy apps like Cartes du Shell, which is basically a planetarium uh, application that can initiate go-tos from the laptop. So for me to be able to interface with that application, I used an interfacing library standard called the ASCOM. Today, actually, it came out before 2006. And right now, ASCOM is a very popular in a telescope interface. So that means uh, a lot of planetarium application, uh, auto-guiding application can interface with that tel the same telescope using the ASCOM standard. So any ASCOM compliant application, they can actually talk to one another. Okay, so basically it's a, it's a, it's a hub that allows multiple applications, like in this case, Maxim DL, Cartus Shell, to communicate with the telescope via a command. Okay. So for the user interface, basically it's the, the I just plug, uh, put all the application, uh, the functionalities within that application. Use the red color, and it's good to go. So this is what the user interface for Ikimon looks like right now. So pretty, so pretty much, 
most of the, the uh, add-ons and what you see on Ikemad right now are actually contributed uh, by the community. So the, the moment I released the application, a uh, couple of uh, amateur astronomers worldwide took part in the development, improvements, adding functionalities. Later, I'll show you some of those functionalities that were uh, contributed by the community. And here's the here's the public release announcement that I made during 2006, announcing uh, the open source Ikimod. So I used a platform called FreeWebs, which is a pre-hosting uh, facility. That's where I uploaded all the codes from for people or amateur astronomers to download. So this one, I think I got it from, I announced this to Phil Astro Forum, announcing that you can download this, uh, you can download Ikimod, get the source code. If you wish to, for example, make your own modification, you can do so. And you can uh, actually for, uh, increase the functionality of your uh, setup. Once the release was made, people started to download it. So right now they installed it in their laptop and fabricated the uh, EQ, EQ Direct. Remember, I released this schematic diagram supposed to inst uh, interface uh, your German equatorial to your laptop. And you, so I published that schematic diagram and people started using it. So the, instead of, and there are actually ones uh, they, they fabricated their own or they directly bought the interface from shoestring astronomy. And this, and this was the time the test images came out. So they were testing uh, Ikimot Pulse Guide. So instead of using the ST4 uh, cable, so it basically a uh, Pulse Guide is basically an ASCOM compliant command for auto guiding. So you don't need an ST4 cable for the auto guiding process. So this was a test image from Maurice Valimberti of Australia. He, he was the one who he was actually one of the early adopters of this uh, application, and he was Australian. So it's a good thing he was able to test this from the southern side, southern hemisphere. But he remember if you're developing a telescope application, you need to test it both on the southern side and the northern side. Okay, so part of the test, of the pulse guide to ensure, like for example, in this case, you see round stars. So that means the auto guiding part is uh, working properly. And then we have another test image at that time so from the US side from Garrett Granger. So basically we were happy with the results of the test because if you notice from the image, these are, uh, he got round stars from the tracking. So if you're not, uh, if, for example, if there is an issue with the pulse guiding option, instead of getting round stars, you'll get a uh, trailing or oblong stars. So in this case, the auto guiding is spot on. So we got uh, round stars. And then I'm gonna show you some of the community contributions. So people who adapted, who used Ikimod, since I released it up as an open source application, so a lot of uh, uh, users, amateur astronomers, tried to do some enhancement on the code itself. So one of the avid uh, contributor for the Ikimod platform basically is Chris. He's Chris Shelito, who got, he's actually from the UK. So he got the source code and then made some uh, improvements. Like in this case, he was the one who developed the PEC, uh, PEC, Periodic Error Correction uh, option for Ikimod. So basically what he did was uh, he took record, for example, the pulse of the pulse guide uh, commands and derived a periodic periodic uh, curve, error curve for the mount. And you can, uh, and you can actually uh, upload it to Ikimod so that during the tracking and uh, auto-guiding, with PEC, period, with period, uh, periodic error correction enabled, there, uh, the, the pulse guiding part will be just uh, less. So it, that means there will be uh, less corrections while PEC is active. So actually this tool has made um, EQ mode more uh, popular because of the on spot on tracking because of this tool. Chris, Chris also wrote a polar alignment tool, 
tool for EQMOD. So basically, it's just an, an aid for the polar alignment. So one of this, this, is, this is actually one of the tools that made the EQMOD more popular. Okay, here's one of the work I'm really proud of, Mosaic Go Tools. So the idea is to automate the scope movements in a grid-like pattern when shooting mosaic images. So meaning uh, what you'll do, what the, the code does is, for example, if you just click the square, it will actually point to this part of the uh, sky. So it's like a grid-like go to. So you need to click each square so it will uh, move in a grid-like pattern. For So for each square you click, you could take an image, shoot an image, and click on the next uh, square, grid uh, square so for the next uh, grid. So, uh, grid uh, shot. So you just you just need to click each square. So equip mode will perform a grid go go to. So user will then be able to shoot an image, then click on the next square for the next shot. So the grid size movement is actually adjustable using these sliders, which should basically match the field of view of your camera, so that there is enough uh, overlap. In this case, for stitching the for the stitching process. So that's EQ Mosaic. That's one of the applications uh, developed under the EQ Mod platform. Another contribution is EQ Mod satellite tracking. Because at that time, there was there's this uh, satellite tracking software just using uh, the LX200 uh, protocol. So I wrote a protocol translation program that converts LX200 commands to stepper motor speed and step count. So it actually sets the step the speed both uh ra and the deck step stepper motors for proper uh satellite uh tracking so with this tool you can literally set the right ascension and declination motors at the prescribed speed and for the for it to be able to position the scope on the location of the satellite moving on the location of the moving satellite so here's a quick demo, for example, if this is a global star M030 satellite. So through EQ mod, I was able to set the speed each motor at the correct speed to keep that the, the satellite center. So that's how precise the application. So this one is actually tracking the satellite, so you can actually see the stars moving on, along the way. So it's always on the center. And then there's another code that I wrote, Wikimod spiral, spiral Search. At that time, I got this idea from uh, users of Wikimod. So I didn't write a code for spiral search. So basically, I had to add this function where I had to move the scope in a spiral outward pattern by rotating the R and deck motors at specific intervals, creating that spiral movement. So basically, what it does is you just click the spiral search button and you look at the eyepiece. So until you see, for example, the bright star that you're looking for, so I'm not sure if this was a, a very a popular uh, function at that time, but they asked they asked me to write one for it for Ikemon. And this one, so uh, actually to accurately to accurately point, for example, the scope to a target deep sky object, I wrote code to map a telescope pointing model using three reference points. So basically, this uh, this is actually a three star coordinate transformation. So you use three three reference stars. So you point each. So you, to create that uh, three point reference, for example, you manually point the scope to a bright star. Take note of its RA and deck coordinates, catalog coordinates, and the current motor step count. So the motor step count of the RA and deck motor. So from here, you can actually record, for example, what motor position value for, uh, for this specific star. And then I basically, and you do this also for the, two, the next two stars. So to form a three star configuration. So it's, it's some sort of a triangle uh, conf config. So, so basically use an algorithm called affine transformation to to compute for the motor step count process. 
So basically, this is the catalog stars. So this is one is stored on the database. For example, the star Pika. So there's a specific RA and the coordinates for that. And then if you look, if you center it on the on the IPs, for example, for example, if you center it, it's in this apparent location. So I, I use and I got then I what I did was I recorded the stepper motor position. So same for the next two stars. So the, basically it will form a triangle. So for me to be able to initiate a go-to, for example, to this catalog coordinate, the actual position based on the shift of these three measured is actually here. So that means if I go, if I command the telescope to go to, to this location, instead of pointing it to this location, it's actually here. So I use the coordinate transformation process to point the star here. So basically what... This actually made EQMOD very popular in terms of the go-to process because, because of this uh, transformation uh, uh, algorithm, which basically it's matrix transformation. We all used to use this, yeah, study this during our high school days. So basically it's a matrix transformation. Basically using this uh, algorithm, it, uh, all, most of the go-tos under EQMOD is actually on the center of the IPs. That's what uh, actually made it, this uh, application very popular. And then uh, aside from three star, I also uh, coded what we call the N star coordinate transformation. So basically it's it's uh, multiple three stars. So for example, uh, what it does is, uh, get you align, to multiple stars across the sky, bright stars, you use this as reference, point, reference points. So for example, if I choose to do a go-to from this location, I'll just simply choose the nearest three star and then apply the three star coordinate transformation. So basically it's an N star with using the three stars, three nearest uh, stars. So, so anyone can actually uh, align the stars, uh, use reference stars, and create a list from here. So I, I wrote code for us, for, for users to be able to maintain that list. And during go to, it is simply choose the nearest three points as a reference, uh, uh, as a reference uh, model, and then from there it will initiate the go to. So basically, it's it's actually the end start that made. Uh, uh, the go-to process very accurate. And then I also wrote code for the pulse guiding part. So instead of using ST4, um, all, is, all is done through EQMOD. So you don't have an, you don't need to use an X, uh, ST4 cable for you to be able to perform auto guiding. So this work hand in hand with the popular auto guiding app such as PHD which communicates to EQMOD via ASCOM. So instead of uh, using uh, ST4 cable, you only need to use ASCOM. And then I also introduced the wireless joystick option for EQMOD. So it's actually best to use this as instead of the mouse. Because for example, if you're operating uh, your German Equatorial Mount, using a laptop and you just use a mouse, it's very difficult to navigate, especially if you're looking at the IPs but at the same time operating the mouse. So I, I added this option. So instead of using uh, on the mouse, basically any, any gamepad or game controller can be used. And it's just simply, mat, sim, uh, simply of interfacing with your laptop to a, US, a USB cable or via Bluetooth. Another contribution I made is the GPS module. So I added an option for EQ mode code to read data from a GPS module. So you don't have to manually type the coordinates. And then Chris uh, wrote code for EQ mode called ASCOM pad, which basically an interface through ASCOM. It, you can use to control uh, your uh, IP's uh, focuser. Through through the use of a game through the use of the gamepad, 
So from the game gamepad, you can actually control the scope, even the focuser and other uh, other devices. And here's another popular application part of the Ikimod project, which is also written by Chris, Chris Yulito. Uh, it's called, basically, it's called Ikitour. So basically, it's, you need, it's, it's a list of uh, deep sky objects that you can load to this application. And during, for example, star parties, you can simply click on that list, click an item on that list, and Ikimod will perform the go to. So for star parties, for example, if you need to prepare or uh, prescribe a, a list of the sky, deep sky objects you want to observe for that night, you just create that list, load it into this application. And during the st uh, star party demo, just click on it and it will, uh, Ikimod will just do the go to itself, go to, to the uh, deep sky object. So here's the Ikimod website. So we try to compile everything, all the contributions of the community. So it's under this website, including the downloads. So the user guides are, are all here. So it's under ikimodsourceforge.net. We also have under that website, all the documentations that uh, the community has prepared, written. So I was not actually, I was the one who, who wrote these documents. It's actually the community who wrote them and they were published uh, here and on this website. And then we also have some, a uh, couple of documentations, Wikimod, the, the, the diagram itself. So for example, if people wishes to download the code, do some modification, we have a good reference site, a reference document for it. And one of the option um, option I added on Ikimod is a language file. So that means it's not only for English users. So people, for example, from France, Spain, they can actually use the uh, language file that they can use to edit. So they can actually change the uh, words within the user interface. For example, if instead of English, it can be in Spanish. So you just have to edit those files. So it's a multi-language uh, application. So here's a sample of a observatory setup using Ikimod. So there are actually a couple, lot of users uh, posting their, uh, images of their observatory using the Ikimod platform. So here's another example. And then there's this one guy who created a generic stepper motor platform that talks directly to Ikimod. It's called Astro EQ. So basically, it's a, a Arduino based uh, stepper motor control where you can mount a RA and a depth stepper motor to any generic German equatorial mount and have full Ikimod control. So the gear ratios are fully customizable via software. So it's called Astro EQ. So if you want to, for example, to motorize a generic mount, any generic mount, just download the software, use a, a fabricate your own uh, Arduino based uh, stepper control. And you can actually directly mount those uh, custom stepper motors to your German equatorial mount. So with this application, actually you can, uh, for example, if there are, depending on the gear ratios, you can actually set the gear ratio using the Astro EQ config app. So you just specify the ratios and then upload it to the Arduino. And then from there, you can actually use EQ mode to control the mount using the Astro EQ platform. And here are a couple of reviews from uh, the astronomy community. So my favorite word here is actually Ikimod Rocks. <laughs> so these are the reviews that came out after I published the code. So what it really made uh, Ikimod popular is basically the accuracy of the go-to uh, because of that uh, three-star transformation process.
and then we for us to be able to support multiple users we set up a yahoo groups at the time which is basically the ikimad yahoo groups but, but right now with the shutdown of the EQ, EQ, you moved, uh, ikimad yahoo groups service years ago we moved all the data to its new home at groups.io so that's the new uh, groups community so then we also have the uh, project technical support. So it's basically users supporting users. So from the community, they usually try to give time to help new users from uh, just from setting up the, the equipment platform. He also, now to keep track, for example, of users making adjustments on the source code, we have this source code versioning. So it's very important if you release any application to the public, and if you want to track its modifications, uh, changes, you have to put it in a version in version control sy uh, system. Here we're using SourceForge for it. So we have a version control. So any changes we keep track. So what is EQ mod today? So right now, if you look at, uh, for example, in uh, YouTube, you see a lot of uh, uh, tutorial videos from users, from different users. So it's not actually me providing the tutorial, but it's actually the users themselves that are providing the tutorial on how to use Ikimod. So there are about a lot of uh, tutorial videos coming out uh, for the Ikimod platform, whether it's in German, in Spanish, in fr uh, in French. There are a lot of uh, uh, tutorial videos, so that means this actually help in prolifer. I mean, making the Ikimod platform very popular among uh, amateur astronomers. So it's basically users helping users to to adapt and use the on uh, adapt or use the Ikimod platform. So some of them you in uh, Spanish, for example. So if you need to watch them, you need to enable closed captioning and YouTube translate. And here are a couple of images uh, posted on Astrobin. So Astrobin basically is a global uh, repository of astro images from astro astrophotographers around the world. You will see uh, quite a number of images using the Ikimod platform. So here there are about 8,477 as of now. Basically, this does this does not include that images. Uh, this does this does not include images that are tagged with uh, Ikimod. So there are actually a lot of images that are posted as to being our image using the Ikimod platform. And here's an, an, another interesting part uh, from Do Anderson of Shoestring in basic uh, astronomy shop. He, had, he published the uh, IQDIR, IQDIRECT. And then from there, a lot, uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, shops, astronomy shops have made their own cables and sell, sell them. So they called it, they called it IQMOD cables. So if you want to, your laptop com computer to talk to a German equatorial mount, you just need to buy the IQMOD cable. This was all actually uh, mass produced from uh, China. So I was quite amazed that there are a lot of uh, cables that came out. And then EQMOD was also ported uh, under the Linux platform uh, using the INDI, INDI library. INDI basically is like ASCOM in, in, the, uh, in the Linux platform. So if you are targeting a Linux or Unix-based astronomy platform instead of Windows, then you need to explore the indie libraries. And then another product that was actually uh, ported with uh, ported with Ikimod is this uh, AC Air. Basically, it's an indie-based uh, uh, platform with all the the tracking software, guiding software in one uh, box. So the indie port, an indie, an indie port version of Ikimod was also used there. So all Sky, Skywatcher, German Equatorial Mounts, Skywatcher based on, are using actually Ikimod if you are using ASI Air in this case. 
So I guess that's the end of my slide. I hope we did not bore you with all the presentation. So if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Mon. Is it a long, uh, I mean, sorry. No. <laughs> may, may I suggest that you, you write a, a book on the Ikiumod story <laughs> <laughs> before, before you, you uh, forget about it. <laughs> And it's a uh, it's always to also inspire the the younger people to to, mm -hmm. to when they read it uh, uh, how how it went about and uh, if they can also uh, try to emulate. Uh, actually, the, they the can problem. use yeah. this. Yes, yeah. actually, they can use this for their thesis if they really want to improve. For example, the yeah. astronomy student, astronomy astronomy students, if they want to uh, get the code for their thesis, they can actually use this as a reference. Uh, do we have do we have questions? Uh, there are no questions yet. In, ah, there's a question here in the Q and A tab from Thomas Encarnacion. I'll mm -hmm. read it. Uh, thank you for creating this great software and especially publishing it as an open source project. Just something I'm trying to achieve. I have a non-motorized EQM and is playing around with on-step project. My understanding is that EQ mod will work directly with GoTo mounts. Is there a project that makes a non-GoTo mount? work with EQ mod? Okay, I actually mentioned one during the presentation. It's called Astro EQ. So basically it's an Arduino based uh, platform, which you can actually download the schematic and then you can fabricate your own uh, stepper control using uh, Arduino. And the code itself, once you load that code to Astro EQ, uh, to that Arduino, you can actually now control the mount directly using EQ mod. So Astro EQ is basically an open source uh, hardware platform that is EQ mod compatible. Thank you, Mon. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, it's, it's more of a comment here from uh, Sonic Duran. No questions so far, just very impressive. Thank you for developing the EQ mod. Thank you. Uh, for... <laughs> in the meantime, uh, Mon, uh, you mentioned the, the, the cables and the EQ mod, uh, uh, stuff that are being sold in China. Are, are these things all, all already available in Lazada or, or what's well, actually, that? Most of, <laughs> most of them are available in Lazada, Shopee, Shopee um, yeah. Amazon. <laughs> so you can, it's actually commoditized basically. Uh, so we can actually get one of those from the shop. I actually bought one as a souvenir. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, we can schedule another online uh, lecture for you to teach us the, uh, at least a, a basic uh, uh, way of modifying our mounts uh, mm -hmm. uh, with EQ mode uh, for the, for, because I noticed there are a lot of new people now going into astrophotography uh, uh, online. So have, have they consulted you? Not yet. Uh, not yet. <laughs> but I did see a boom in, uh... Yeah. They use Pikimod, for example, during the pandemic. Uh, yeah. A lot of because a lot of people are in their houses, so they took to astro astro photography instead because they they're stuck with their uh, mount for the, the entire pandemic. Oh, by the way, uh, Imelda and Edwin are here. Uh, they have comments or questions, Edwin. Yeah, actually we do. Um, well, first of all, uh, I just want to say uh, it's nice meeting you, Raymond, even uh, virtually. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> virtually. So it's my first time seeing you, uh, you know, in person and hearing your lecture. So very impressive with what you're doing. Um, I do have a, a question. Uh, I apologize if you have already addressed this earlier in your talk because mm -hmm. uh, we were a bit late logging in. But my question is about uh, harmonic drive. I noticed that, uh, for example, ZWO offers their uh, AM5 equatorial mm -hmm. mount, and it's advertised as using harmonic drive. And I read that uh, the advantages are it's lighter than a classic uh, German equatorial mount, uh, doesn't need counterweights and has zero backlash, which are all good for astrophotographers. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, my question is, uh, can you just explain briefly what is a harmonic drive? How does it work? And if your EQ mode would work with harmonic drives? Harmonic drive, basically, it's, uh, it's, not actually, it's not using a stepper motor in this case. It's basically a series of electromagnets that's uh, rotating a central core. So basically what it does, it create, creates a pulse of electromagnetic uh, pulse coils that rotates a central core. So it's basically it's much better than a stepper motor because in stepper motors, you rotate the mount in, ste in steps. So, but this one is using coils in this case. So uh, for, for me to be able to, for example, interface uh, the PDEQ mode, I mean, basically it's, it's just a standard step uh, motor driver. So for me to be able to control it, you just have to use write code for EQ mode that can actually specify, for example, the speed, uh, the speed, the amount of rotation. So basically that's it. Raymond, I, I believe the ACA works with the, with, uh, with the harmonic drive of CWO. Yeah, because uh, I, it has I, yeah, its own yeah. in B driver, actually. Yes, it's stolen. Okay, uh, follow up question, Raymond. Since it uses electromagnets instead of uh, traditional worm gear, you know, the mechanical mm -hmm. drive, so it has zero periodic error? Zero yeah. periodic error, backlash would be once the moment you use worm gears, actually, that's the the uh, introductory to the, that's actually the one introducing the periodic errors. We're mm -hmm. using warm gears in this case, but since one, this one is actually a direct drive. So mm -hmm. there's no periodic error in this case. Great, time to save money by that uh, AM5. <laughs> <laughs> I think the prices are coming down, but they're still uh, on the expensive side. So mm -hmm. thank you, Raymond. I appreciate this, it. Uh, yeah, these are good for uh, uh, for the, the, the one that was mentioned by uh, uh, the, the harmonic drives are actually good. Uh, they're, they're very portable because you don't need the counterweights, especially for uh, solar eclipses and so on. But in relation to that, Raymond, uh, uh, talking about expense, I noticed that uh, uh, some mounts now are being sold with a very, very expensive encoders. So what are encoders and uh, uh, What's the advantage uh, of it over the, the the modifications that you mentioned? Okay, with the uh, encoders, actually, there's in the standard the uh, German equatorial mount with the tel uh, with the stepper motors. You basically feed the, the signals to allow the motor to rotate based on the uh, number of step counts. But there's no feedback actually, so it doesn't the application doesn't have any idea on what that's the current position of that scope. But it's the current position of that stepper motor. So we use encoders for the feed, for the feedback part. So it has a tracking in terms of the position. So those are the main function of those uh, encoders. So there are mounts that are actually have encoders in them. So for example, if uh, the controlling application, instead of just providing the number of step counts, they can actually get the number the actual position of the mount, the physical mount itself, the physical uh, position of the stepper motors. Why are they so expensive? Actually, the, 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 that hardware is not that expensive. I'm not sure why you <laughs> made it so expensive. Like but you have the to encoder yeah, part is add, actually a standard yeah. hardware. They add uh, thousands of dollars uh, for that mm -hmm. temperature. Yeah. Maybe you should work on that as well. <laughs> <laughs> That would be nice. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, 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 yes, I have one, uh, Raymond. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding, for example, the ASIC, right now the current ASIC airs, no? Uh, they, they also, they were able to do plate solving, right? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, Actually, the plate solving. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, uh, does it, Yung, the plate solving right now, the, like for example, using the Nina or even the AC Air, uh, does the plate solve uh, algorithm 
also came from what you made the EQ mode. Ah, no, no, that, that one is different because right now, uh, under with EQ mode, basically it's the three star coordinate transformation. That one is actually oh. computing based on reference stars. But in uh, plate solving, it is actually offered by a different uh, application within uh, as air. It's actually part of the Indie library. I'm not sure if it's part. There's this application called Dina hmm. that can actually do yes. plate solving. So when you do plate solving, basically it takes images of the sky. You get those reference uh, stars. Uh, from those stars that are actually laid out on that image, they can actually compute for the coordinates. So the telescope will basically know which part of the sky is, is pointed to through that uh, uh, plate solving process. So I think the, uh, the one offering that is Nina. Nina. It's, uh, actually, if you search, there's, a, uh, there's it's usually a tandem between EQ mode and Nina. Yeah. So, so actually, uh, so, so uh, Lalwas, your ACR and Nina are actually this uh, doing the plate solving, no? Actually, yes. uh -huh. they are quite accurate naman so far. They're, no, they're very I'm, accurate I'm because they're actually computing based on the, what the, uh, the stars are on the images. Yeah, but so, uh, after, but uh, for me, my experience with it is uh, so far, it's okay, no? It's tracking, it's mm -hmm. helping the guiding. Uh, but uh, once the, the a little problem is once it do with the meridian flip, no? Once it do with the meridian flip, uh, that's where some of, yeah, <laughs> and also the. The plate solving uh, algorithm tries to take up with it, no? but uh, so far I'm not that good with it. Uh, but some people also were able to uh, to solve to use the plate solving to realign uh, the the subject into the frame again. Mm -hmm. okay. That's it. Thank you, James. Uh, are there any other questions uh, before? We proceed. Well, if none, uh, actually, yeah, uh, yeah, I just yeah, have one yeah, quick yeah. question for for Raymond. Okay. Are you planning uh, an AZ mod, an Altasimus version of your program? Ah, uh, okay. Actually, EQ mod can be also used with AZ mounts. Easy months also. You can uh, actually use that. There was uh, this, uh, I mean, there's this project. Uh, he tried to use the Ikimoda, Ikimoda code on a Dobson, uh, Dobsonian uh, Alta Azimut plat board platform. So with uh, track, I mean, I mean, with uh, he, he tried to use a encoders to for to, to for example for it to be able to determine the position of the telescope and then from there he tried to use the pointing algorithm of ikimod for him to, to be able to derive the for example the ra and the coordinates of the uh, encoders i mean the alt altitude and azimuth uh, values of the encoders so there's this project maybe i'll most probably i will share it uh, great Thank you, Raymond. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah, sure. We'll do. Thank you. Uh, any other questions uh, from our panelists? There are no more questions from the Q&A. Well, if none, uh, Raymond, thank you again. Thank you so much uh, for doing all of this. And uh... Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So let me take this opportunity to present our ALP certificate of appreciation for your talk. Uh, this certificate from the Astronomical League of the Philippines uh, reads as follows. This certificate is presented to Raymond Sarmiento for his invaluable insights, experiences, and expertise shared with the participants for the talk, the EQ Mod fl platform, held as part of the ALP Global Astronomy Month 2023 program given this uh, 15th of April, 2023, signed by the president, uh, James Kevin T, and vice president, uh, 
Jose Francisco Aguilar, yours truly. Thank you. Uh, and uh, after this uh, uh, certificate of appreciation, we have a surprise for you, uh, Raymond. So James, uh, can you can you mention this? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll show yeah, you the you graphics. Share? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. Uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, Raymond Sarmiento uh, for being the 2023 Father Victor Badillo Astronomy Service Award. No? So the Father Victor Badillo Astronomy Service Award is hereby given to Raymond Sarmiento for his outstanding innovation and contributions to the development of the EQ mode, a revolutionary open source telescope mount controller used by astronomers worldwide. Given this 15th day of April at the ALP Global Astronomy Month 2023 webinar talk, signed James Deventy, President of ALP. Congratulations, Raymond. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations, actually, Raymond. Raymond, i uh, like to apologize uh, for this. Uh, actually, this uh, awarding should have been given to you in uh, 2020, no? But <laughs> the, the current time of lockdown, <laughs> so... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so i like to apologize on that, but actually, you were already lined up to get this award. No? So, congratulations again. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, thank you very uh, much. Thank, uh, that's just a small token for everything that you've done. <laughs> thank you. Actually, you a, deserve yeah. it. Yeah. Can we have a group picture, James? Raymond? Oh, you're muted, James. Okay, okay. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Raymond, for accepting our invitation for this. Uh, actually, it's not too technical as you said, no. But uh, <laughs> actually, I'd like to thank you also to na na, na hindi nyo ginawang too uh, technical, technical. or uh, no split, no. <laughs> but actually, uh, it was well. Uh, Pero na intindihan naman namin. It's not that. Uh... <laughs> yes, and also, uh, actually, uh, actually, I'm quite happy to tell you that actually. So this uh, online uh, registrant participant is a little bit high also, no? For who are interested in your topic, no? so actually I'd like to congratulate you also on that. Uh, I actually, uh, to, yeah. Uh, I was hoping that uh, through this uh, discussion, uh, we will we will inspire more people to come up with their own ideas. Then, if they have the good idea, just publish them and let the community. Uh, for example, decide on what to do next. So there are a lot of actually ideas that are coming out, but uh, hopefully that uh, more Pinoy's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, made uh, will made more contributions to the astronomy community. Thank you, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully this platform will uh, would uh, uh, disseminate uh, to more people what you are doing, Raymond. Thank you, especially to yeah. our fellow fellow Filipinos. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let, let's proceed now to another great talk and uh, interesting talk. Wait. So our next talk uh, will be given by Mr. Enrico Africa on remote astrophotography. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Enrico Africa or Eric is also a member of the Cincinnati Astronomical Society, aside from the Astronomical League of the Philippines. Eric will discuss the options available for remote astrophotography and the solutions he had discovered based on his own experience. Eric is a passionate amateur astronomer and astrophotographer and had been interested in astronomy for most of his life. The apparition of comet Hayakutake in 1996 triggered his interest in observational astronomy. Comet Hale-Bopp in 1997 got him into astrophotography, first using film and then digital imaging starting in 2001. Many of his images have been featured in Sky and Telescope, Astronomy Magazine, and Astronomy Now magazines. He has been using a remote observatory in the dark skies of New Mexico since 2011. So Eric, uh, uh, we'll give you now the floor for your talk. Thank you, Dr. Jet. 
start with sharing my screen. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay. You can see it, Eric. Okay, thank you. Okay, so good day, everybody. I'll be going over uh, the uh, basically remote astrophotography. Why do it? Various options for getting started, an overview of what equipment to work with, and options on where the equipment can be hosted. Now, before we get started, please note that what I'm presenting here is mostly what we personally have experience with, or at least what we're aware of. I may also use the terms astrophotography and imaging interchangeably, but they mean the same thing. In fact, you may hear me say imaging rather than astrophotography, that imaging rolls off the tongue much more easily. Uh, also, in addition, I tended to learn this, uh, this, this whole uh, process of, re of remote imaging by uh, pretty much I learned by doing. So many of my lessons are, are via the school of hard knocks. So some of my solutions are not necessarily the best or the most optimal, but they worked for us at the time. So that said, let's get started. So why get into remote imaging to begin with? Let's start with imaging from a dark sky site. If you're an avid astronomer, you've probably taken a few road trips to dark sites and may be familiar with this workflow. You drive down to a dark site, set up your equipment, gaze until dawn or, or the need to sleep overcomes you, peer down, drive back home. With a little luck, if you are at a, a multi-night star party, you get to repeat the dust to dawn step for an additional night or two before you have to tear down and finally drive back home. From around 2005 to 2008, this was my primary mode of imaging at a dark site. I would either go to a friend's dark sky site or a club's dark sky site and do this exact workflow listed here. I don't believe we ever attended a multi-night star party, so unfortunately we never we never had to experience multiple nights of, of dark skies at a, at, at a time. Uh, so pretty much every night was a, a one night trip. For instance, this M8, M20 image was shot at a state park in Ohio about a 45 minute drive away from us and is the result of a single session. Here's a sample of images, of images sorry, taken at the friend's dark sky site and each of these were taken in one session. This comment is note of some note to me because this was actually featured as an Earth Science Picture of the Day image in 2006. As you can see, a lot can be accomplished in single night sessions. So, what if you didn't have to do any of that? What if you can sit in the comfort of your home or anywhere that, that's got an internet connection as long as you have a device that you can use to, con to connect to a telescope that's uh, located at some remote site that's excellent for astronomy and per, uh, potentially perform dusk to dawn imaging with little more effort than turning your computer on and repeat this night after night, accumulating lots and lots of hours of exposure on a single target. Or consider this, it's overcast or worst case scenario, pouring rain outside, but you're actually still able to image. For instance, I was able to capture this image of the lunar eclipse of April 15, 2014, during a light snow shower at our house. How did we do that? From a remote observatory we operated at the time where the skies were clear. Isn't that sweet? Let's see how one can live that dream. Let's start with a discussion on equipment. While I presume many of you in the audience are avid amateur astronomers, I'll go ahead and start with the basics. I won't go too deep into discussing the details of the types of equipment that we can choose from, as those can be the topics of talks on their own. So that said, let me start from the ground up. I'm sure many of us started astronomy by peering into the eyepiece of a telescope. This slide goes over the most basic list of equipment that one may need to start astronomy at the visual level. You will, of course, need a set of optics or an optical tube assembly, which I will refer to as an OTA for this talk. That OTA will need to be mounted somehow, and I've listed the two basic types of mounts that are most used. The alt azimuth mount is the most intuitive to use for most, 
uh, and note that the popular Dobsonian mounted Newtonians are actually using alt azimuth mounts. Anyway, you would likely also need a finder scope to help locate the targets, or at least help to help initialize a go-to mount. And last but not least, you will need an eyepiece to properly view the targets you're viewing. For your entertainment, here are our first two major telescope purchases. The first was a Mead 4500, which has a 114 millimeter reflector on a manual German equatorial mount. That was replaced with, a, with uh, our dream visual setup of the time, an 8-inch Mead LX200 uh, with, um, with uh, basically it's an 8-inch uh, at a Schmidt Cassegrain on a fork mounted go to mount. And it's pictured with the Borg 76 ED refractor, which we added a few years later. And I believe this picture was captured while we were uh, observing and, and shooting a, a lunar eclipse. As I mentioned in the prior slide, I thought I was done with our astronomy equipment purchases when we bought the LX200. This was the case for those who enjoy the heavens visually, or is the case for those who enjoy the heavens visually. I set our visual equipment up almost every clear night to view whatever our light polluted backyard would allow. Over time, however, I felt this desire to share with friends and family pictures of what I was enjoying through the eyepiece. I mean, I was looking through the eyepiece and really enjoying the views and it's like, gee, I wish I, there, there's, there was only a way to, to share what I was seeing through, through this. So I ended up diving into imaging, and we ended up diving pretty deep. We initially used that LX200, which we equatorially mounted on a wedge, for our first couple of imaging sessions. But setting that up uh, every night got old pretty fast. So we assembled a dedicated imaging configuration that was easier to set up, or at least not as hard to set up. While we did go through an equipment change, in many respects, a visual setup can actually be built upon. As you can see, a li the list of equipment for imaging starts with the same pieces of equipment, specifically an OTA, a mount, and a finder scope. The eyepiece is optional and eventually gets set aside once the, the camera goes on where the eyepiece normally would go. In fact, uh, many times when I image, there's no eyepiece attached to the scope, just the camera. Nowadays, a consumer digital camera is more than capable of taking awesome astrophoto oh, yeah, astro astrophotographs. I will, however, keep the focus of this talk on dedicated astronomy cameras. For that reason, you will almost always, and this is barring future technological advances, need some kind of software to control that camera, which requires, of course, a computer uh, um, connected to that camera and the mount, and likely the mount. Also, um, Many nowadays, actually, many dedicated astronomy cameras are available as full color models. And again, awesome photographs can be taken with these one shot color cameras. But the most flexible setups uh, use monochrome cameras with, with filter wheels. And so I'm listing here as the equipment. Speaking of the mount, for imaging purposes, this will most likely be an equatorial mount with go to capabilities, as well as the ability to communicate with the computer which will likely be loaded with planetarium software con for controlling the mount. I will say there are imagers who successfully work with non-go-to mounts, but we are building towards remote imaging here. So for the sake of this discussion, the mount will be a computer-controlled go-to mount. I'm listing here the equipment and software that we used to start our foray into imaging back in 2003. The picture shown is not our equipment, but it's very representative of what we used at the time. And uh, yeah, the cam this camera was our first um, full-fledged deep sky imaging camera. Time marched on. And as our desires for better images progressed along with the desire for reducing our time sitting next to the telescope, our equipment evolved. We, we started by adding a focus motor that we can control by, by software, specifically the RoboFocus motor and associated software. We learned how to automate focusing via fo this fo FocusMax software. We eventually uh, switched OTAs to a dedicated imaging telescope, the Takahashi FSQ-106. We also updated our camera to, the, to an SD STL-6303 with an eight position filter wheel and filters for both LRGB and narrowband imaging. And this background image is uh, 
an example of the product of that combination of equipment. At this stage, we were setting up around dusk and imaging until sometime after midnight every clear night. We would, some, we would of course go later during weekends and holidays, but we still had to get some sleep. So many times we tore down feeling bad about wasting a sky that was forecast to be clear until dawn or beyond. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to start an imaging session, periodically refocusing, auto-guiding through the night, and just sleep while our equipment gathered up photons until dawn? Enter image automation, automation software. At that time, the software available that we selected was CCD Autopilot. This worked wonderfully. When it was properly configured, we would simply tell it to select a target and shoot for as long as we wanted, however many exposures for however many, however, however long through, a, through the filters through the night. Uh, we, it would, it would auto-guide wonderfully and uh, adjust exposure times based on the filters that we were using. It would know when to do a meridian flip, when to refocus, and then it also it can also detect when dawn hits and then shoot shoot uh, sky flats and then park the telescope and end the session. I may have thrown out a few imaging terms here, such as dithering, meridian flips, and flats. Uh, many imagers are familiar with those terms. I won't discuss those at, in, in detail at this point. And if time permits, though, uh, feel free to ask about these during the Q&A. OK, I've gone through our personal equipment journey with backyard and occasional road trip imaging. Throughout that era, we were still setting up and tearing down every clear night we, we needed to image. This was getting old, and the next logical step would have been to install a backyard observatory. That way, we would no longer have to assemble or disassemble our equipment each and every night. I'll jump ahead a little bit here. While we did build a backyard observatory, we never automated it. But for those of you who wish to do so, this slide covers the basic uh, equipment or requirements for automating or at, or at most remote controlling an observatory. You'll of course need a means to open the roof remotely, you may also uh, want to monitor the weather conditions so you can decide if it's a good night for imaging or not. And if, you're really, uh, if you really want to, to, to automate the process, even have the, equip the weather equipment decide whether to open the roof for you or not. In our case, while our backyard observatory was not automated or remote controlled, we did have the necessary equipment for operating the roofs of our remote observatory. Uh, this is the, our, our first roll off roof picture. This roll-off roof was initially operated with a modified garage door opener, which was eventually replaced with a sky roof system, which, which were operated much more reliably and is better designed for roll-off roof observatories. Our current remote observatory is in a dome that's controlled by an automa dome system. Note that the equipment considerations listed in this slide will only be of concern if you build for, well, basically for building your own observatory on your own property. Most remote observatory hosting sites usually have solutions for this topic in place. Spoiler alert. All the equipment discussed in the prior slides apply to those going through assembling the equipment needed for operating any automated observatory. In other words, if your goal is to operate an automated observatory in your backyard, or if this is the observatory that, that you actually um, operate at the site, so in other words, if it's a dark site that you drive down to and operate your, your observatory there, you can actually stop at the prior slide. However, if your goal is truly imaging at your own remote observatory, you'll need to consider the items in this slide as well. First, let's talk cable management. For visual astronomers, this is pretty much a non-issue. Again, well, not not to uh, not not to uh, uh, stereotype here, but uh, but basically, if, if you if you were basically a pure visual astronomer operating a Dobsonian telescope, you'd be going, "What's a cable?" But uh, now, if you had a tracking mount, add the power cable. If you add a camera, add the power and the data cable, and especially if you have a computer. So if you have a computer, we're talking power cables for the computer add cables to the computer to talk to the mount, to the, to the focuser, power the focuser, and, and so on and so forth. Those add up quickly. Uh, fortunately today, 
Uh, there are manufacturers who are coming up with more and better solutions to reduce cable clutter or address cable management. This is still a topic for, uh, for at least some concern. The last thing you would want in, a, in the case of a remote observatory is for a cable to come loose during an imaging run when you're hundreds or even thousands of miles away and you have no recourse to, to uh, address that but actually travel to the observatory. In general, you will have to consider anything that, any possible malfunction that's an inconvenience at worst if it happens to your backyard versus having to deal with that same malfunction when your observatory is a considerable distance away. Titling this topic as cable management is just one of the things that come to mind for me when thinking remote observatories. In fact, I'll just we can we're kind of like using cable cable management as our, as our own catchphrase for anything that can go wrong. Um, and in fact, another another way of thinking about it is driving to a remote to well basically to a remote site and forgetting that that um, that little set screw for your counterweight. <laughs> so I still say we still say cable management as a catchphrase because that that's bitten us uh, personally. Anyway. Another consideration is power management. You'll want the capability of turning the power to your observatory on and off from, from a distance. Fortunately, there are off-the-shelf solutions for that, such as this digital logger uh, web power switch. And also, I should also mention that, yeah, you will want some kind of a search, search protector, UPS, and, uh, and some form of lightning protection. You'll also want some ability to monitor your observatory. No matter what your software is telling you is happening, it's always best to verify what's being reported by actually having eyes in place. In other words, trust but verify. You don't want your software saying, yeah, I'm, I'm, everything is fine, we're slewing to the target, when, when actually the telescope's going upside down and about to ram into your peer. <laughs> so uh, fortunately, Webcams are a relatively inexpensive solution for this purpose. One tip, make sure that the webcam has a night vision feature that you can turn on and off. And uh, um, because a night vision is actually code for an infrared flashlight. Um, the last thing you really want is to have a flashlight aimed at your telescope while you're taking pictures. <laughs> and an infrared light is the same thing as a flashlight as far as an imaging setup is concerned. Of course, in order to allow for all the above to work and be controlled remotely, you will need an internet connection available in the remote observatory. The observatory we operated from 2011 to 2018 uh, did not actually have any weather monitoring hardware. We, we simply relied on weather forecasts for the area based on a forecast from the Clear Sky Clock or the National Weather Service. And, and now these are all these are both these services are are US based services or Canada based services. Um, I would hope that there would be similar services available elsewhere in the world. The site we were on also had other users who did have weather stations and even an all sky camera that they um, very generously shared with us so so we did not need our own equipment for for that. There are also many times when if the forecast for the area was not good. We just never, just never opened the roof. Also, note that as in the prior slide, if your equipment is being hosted at a remote observatory business, at least some of these considerations are already being taken care of by the host. Did I mention cable management? As I've emphasized, cables can quickly go out of control if you are not careful. We ended up with this solution of building our or bundling all, all our cable hubs to a plate that we bolted to the top of the scope. You may wonder why, uh, since this is a paramount that offers through the mount cabling, why we opted not to use that feature. It's, it was because we were just not comfortable with having to partially disassemble the mount to get at a bad cable. We just wanted it to be easier to, ac to access all these cables. And uh, this, this also, this basically made all our cables uh, that we use at the time uh, easy to reach. So we configured and tested and tested again. We pointed the scope to many regions of the sky. Actually, not, not manually, we actually sent commands to point to whatever regions of the sky uh, were available to verify that, that there would be no snag and yanking and, and, and tangling. So uh, again, this was the solution we came up with and 
And again, there many, I'm sure there are, there are many more elegant solutions that could address or prevent this kind of a cable monster. But at the same time, um, probably we would probably go through the mount cabling in the future. This slide lists the equipment that we personally used and operated remotely. Note that much of this equipment was purchased between 2006 and 2013, definitely before CMOS technology made deep sky imaging more accessible. That said, other than the cameras, the equipment used will work as well for, CC for CMOS chipped cameras as they did for CCD chipped cameras. The equipment and software that we personally used have for the most part translated to the present day. That said, new technology and players have arrived in the scene that make the entry into imaging at any level that much more accessible. One aspect I noticed or that I noticed is that uh, mount control, camera control, and even session automation software is available as freeware these days, uh, some of which I've listed here. Um, I, I don't have any experience with them directly or at the very least really just superficial experience. Still though, uh, talking as a grumpy old man, I can say, back in my day, we had to pay for these software packages. Now they're, you're saying they're free? On the hardware side, cameras are now offered at price points that well below that of their CCD counterparts from 20 or so years ago. In the case of ZWO, they're also offering now dedicated com control co uh, computers such as the ASCII Air, which are available at a price point below that of uh, Windows PCs. The move from, C from C CCD to CMOS is of particular note. In the days of CCD, Imagers were used to taking exposures of anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes. This was my specific experience. Nowadays, CMOS cameras allow for, and in many cases actually require to prevent saturating, saturating the chips, exposure times of, from as low as 30 seconds to at most 10 minutes for narrowband images. This reduces the demand of the mounts to the point where many of today's imagers no longer need or want to auto-guide their imaging runs. For CCD imagers, auto-guiding was a must. Okay, we've gone through quite a bit of equipment talk through the last several slides. If I haven't lost any of you yet, let's go over a pretty important piece of equipment. Now that you've figured out a shopping list or a checklist of everything you need for your remote observatory, where the heck do you put it? How do you get started? Fortunately, we've got a few options available. Finding a place to park your imaging equipment, fortunately, is not that difficult. A web search for remote observatory hosting will return a plethora of businesses ready and willing to host your equipment for a monthly fee. The advantages of using one of these services is not limited to what I've listed here in the slide. As I mentioned the equipment topic, many of these businesses will already take care of weather monitoring and roof operation, so really, all you'll need equipment-wise will be your imaging setup. The only possible additional items will be power control and maybe a webcam, and even the webcam's uh, most likely debatable. Okay, so you've gone over the various observatory rental services, but you've decided that you really want to build your own remote observatory. There are many factors to consider when doing so. Just think about buying land, just, buy, just buying any land. You, you know, there's already a lot of, of considerations, legal, um, uh, yeah, or make sure you're buying, your, what you're buying is, is, is free and clear to, to, uh, to, or free and clear to be to buy by you and is owned by the, by the actual seller, so on and so forth. Pile onto that all the other considerations that you want or that you need for, for, um, for remote astrophotography. And by no means is the list on this slide a comprehensive one. It's at least a place to start. Just keep in mind that the nature of a remote location that's far from the lights of civilization will, by necessity, be far from civilization. That, that increases the, the difficulty of setting up any logistics for any construction and support at the property. It's doable. You just have to be aware of everything you need and how you can achieve each of these items. 
one possible uh, scenario, I don't know if it's ideal, but at least it's it's a one some something that will at least make it less hard would be to find an astronomy themed development for like minded people to buy property and set up their observatories. Lacking that, these considerations, and I am sure there are many, many more than these listed, should be factored into the purchase. As I mentioned in the prior slide, an ideal scenario for a location to build a remote observatory of your own would be to find an astronomy themed or at least astronomy friendly development or subdivision. The, the items listed here are just a sample of such developments or subdivisions that I have heard of or seen advertisements for in sites such as Astromart or at Neve. And this is at least a place you can start with. Apologies to the audience for uh, such a US centric list as I'm not aware of what else is available elsewhere in the world. But I imagine that, that, uh, that they would exist. And also what's not listed here are um, the, 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 beginnings, the beginnings of um, dark sky, international dark sky certified sites. I mean, off the top of my head, I can think of, um, I believe it's called Tecapo or Lake Tecapo in New Zealand. Well, so these are not actual developments for astronomy, but they are astronomy themed in that they are dark sky sites. So those are other possible areas to, to explore. So as I mentioned in the prior slides, uh, all the above locations that uh, have in common, at least these, these that we've listed here, are um, a significant distance from major cities, at least a two hour drive. Therefore, at least that far from any logistical help that you may need for the observatory or living in the area. Again, this plays into the factors that to, to, to consider should you decide to find and build an observatory on a remote property. Um, however, uh, one other advantage is that um, one possible advantage of these areas is that since it's these these are likely going to be um, well uh, um, subdivisions for like-minded people, you may have the possibility of some support in the area. There's there's possibly some full-time um, homeowners or or people living there who may be willing to lend a hand should you need uh, some help with your with your equipment. Okay, you might be starting to think. This is all beginning to sound pretty complicated, not to mention a little nerve wracking when you think about transporting all of your equipment and securing it in the middle of nowhere. What if you just want to collect some great data from a fantastic location? Or what if you aren't in the position to go all out with a remote observatory? Or you just want to see what it's like? Fortunately, there is an option for you. Let's discuss this option briefly. Fortunately, there are numerous remote observatory businesses now available around the world. Not surprisingly, remote observatory hosting businesses almost off, always offer some telescopes available for rent. The samples listed on this slide are, are actually, well, most of these are observatory hosting rental sites, but they also have telescopes available to rent by the night. Some of them might even offer rentals by the hour. Note that these items, uh, that these listed are again, only the tip of the iceberg. Um, and they're not necessarily recommendations by us, but uh, I'll also mention that I believe the second one actually is a business that's purely uh, telescope rental. In other words, they don't do hosting, um, unless I'm mistaken. In fact, I believe they actually use an observatory hosting site of their, on their own and, and they just rent their telescopes out by the hour or the night. So as you can imagine, getting started with this option is really quick and easy. You just open an account with the business, reserve time at the telescope, use that a lot of time as you desire. Depending on the nature of the business, you either control the telescope yourself to image whatever target you desire, or uh, there's there's the really lazy technique where you just tell them, okay, please uh, please take this take a picture of this particular target, and they can they'll take care of everything for you, and just you just download the data. Now, the downside to this option, of course, is reserving time at the desired telescope. Popular setups may be difficult to book or available at, or, or available at inconvenient times. In other words, because some of these businesses offer maybe four to six different telescope types. Uh, so uh, you, you may want to, you might want a particular setup available. Um, you may want to shoot a, cert, a certain target using a particular setup, but it may not be available. 
just imagine what if you want to shoot something really faint and the only nights available are during a full moon? Or what if you want to shoot close-ups of galaxies, but the only available setups are those configured for wide field targets? Also, um, uh, the rental costs can add up over time. In general, though, this option is good for those who want to occasionally have access to great data from a great location with little hassle. It's also a great option for those wanting to image targets not available from their location. For instance, thanks to this option, I was able to image NGC 6188, the Fighting Dragons of Ara, which is the featured image on this slide, without having to travel to the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, they, what was even nice was for, with this particular setup, I just asked them to shoot the, the target for me and they did it for me without me even having to touch the telescope. So in summary, remote imaging is a means to access dark skies without having to travel every night. It can help overcome constraints such as time, local weather and sky conditions, exposure to the elements, and if the equipment is in a different part of the world, accessibility to targets not visible from home. For instance, um, Northern Hemisphere uh, observers can shoot targets in the Southern Hemisphere and vice versa. Also, you can get pretty creative. If you have a remote setup and you still have some, something set up at home, you can start shooting, let's say, if you're, if, if uh, again, uh, if you're well, again for a US base observer, if you were in the East Coast, you can start shooting um, your target. And if you had a remote observatory in the West Coast, which is three hours um, earlier, or yeah, they're three hours behind the, the East Coast time, you can continue imaging using a remote observatory in the West Coast. Also, I know of uh, some, some um, uh, collaborations where different time zones can actually even try parallax, or, or what was this, like parallax, um, um imaging so i mean you can get, you can get pretty creative with, with this and um consider this too if the image is if the remote observatory is on the opposite side of the world the imager can be doing daytime astronomy such as solar gazing at home while the remote observatory is performing nighttime imaging and i'm sure there are so many so many options the sky is truly the limit thank you Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, huh? Wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if uh, we can have something like that in the Philippines, uh, something that uh, we have to think about. But thank you so much. Uh, Welcome. Uh, yeah. And Eric, we have actually two questions in the chat box here from Sonic Duran. Uh, the first question are, is what are the most common issues that you face aside from power and connectivity issues? How are they being solved and prevented to recur? Let's see. Uh, just trying to think about uh, what, what, what did we encounter? Uh, school of Hard Knocks, let's see. The first, the first one we encountered was uh, the telescope was not pointing accurately. In fact, that was, that was actually a case where the telescope started going upside down and eventually, what we did, what we uh, discovered was that um, that was we were using an astrophysics mount at the time, uh, and the hand controller was still connected to the mount, and uh, the time change that occurred from switching from standard time to daylight time, and um, the hand controller was was not configured to switch, and the computer was switch, was was programmed to switch, and the mount was just completely confused. So um, eventually, I, I found out that it's, that it's like, okay, we don't need a hand controller attached to the mount, just, just disconnect it. Uh, let's see, what were the others that we encountered? Um, one that definitely needed help, um, that needed help, or rather on-site help, otherwise I would have needed to travel, was um, one of our original setups was, uh, involved, um, um, what was it, an, an, a, a, rot a, a camera rotator, sorry. It was, it was called a tachometer, the, and this involved an external ch like chain, like a little, not, not some kind of like a tooth belt, not, not quite a chain drive, but, but a belt that, that, that turned this gear and it came loose. I, I remember I was watching them. I was watching on the, on the, uh, on the webcam. Fortunately, I was watching it rotate 
And then suddenly the camera just jerked loose. It's like, oh geez, the belt came off. So um and I so I yeah, I ended up calling for help. And fortunately, someone was able to, to reattach it. And let's see. Uh what else? What else? Uh, I'm just trying to remember what else that we experienced. And yeah, so so uh, in fact, I will say that I remember seeing a quote once from a fellow remote imager that the best accessory for our, our remote observatory is on-site help. Yeah, I was about to ask that no? because uh, even we, if we are, don't have a remote observatory, sometimes you have to do a lot of things like uh, tighten this screw and so on, adjust, make these small adjustments, et cetera, et cetera. So you yeah. do need that. It's very essential that you have somebody on site yes. to periodically uh, uh, check your equipment. And this somebody also has to have been trained before or have some experience. Yes. With the equipment. Yes. And um, uh, barring that, the the uh, the worst case scenarios would actually have been traveling to the to the observatory and and I'm and I'm like, um, it, I was thinking it's an inconvenience, but it's like, wait, boo hoo! I'm traveling to a dark sky site to do astronomy. What's what what? Why am I why am I crying? <laughs> uh, thank you, Eric. The the second question is from Sonic Duran is. Is there a website or a link where we can learn how to start our own private remote observatory, like setting up operations, maintenance? Wow, uh, that's a good question. Actually, um, I, I guess uh, the best <laughs> my best answer is Google is your friend, maybe. <laughs> because yeah, off the top of my head, I I I, I don't I, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Or let's see. Uh, Another another possibility would be uh, discussion groups such as uh, cloudy nights. Um, who else might? Yeah, I mean, right, yeah, one of my go-to uh, areas is cloudy nights. And then um, I don't know if there's uh, groups that IO group that uh, that's specific on remote observatory. So um, so yeah, so I just say let's start with Google and see what we come up with because I'm I'm sure that there are many people who who also share their experiences with remote observatories. So users group can be helpful also. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, helpful, but you got to sometimes sift through the noise. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the next question from uh, June M. Buido. Uh, this is a practical question. Hello, Eric. How do you address if you have poor polar alignment in your remote observatory? And also, what is your opinion about the motorized polar alignment that can be controlled remotely? For example, the Avalon mounts. Okay. Um, yeah, the, I, well, again, with, with respect to poor polar alignment in a remote observatory, uh, my best answer would be uh, either relying on uh, local help or, again, travel to the site here for, for that. Um, Motorized polar alignment. Okay, that's news to me. I wasn't even aware of this. Um, yeah, Avalon. I don't know. It's the like Avalon mount. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's that's news to me, and um, that's that's that that I that's actually um, that actually sounds like a dream. My only concern would be that uh, that to make sure that the mounts, because I'm just trying to think about how the motor would would move the the two axes. Let's see. The azimuth axis would be fine. The, the polar axis would be my my concern. And uh, yeah, I I I, I guess it, it, if if there are happy users, then then that that should that should be wonderful. Thank you. So no no real opinion. <laughs> it's it, <laughs> yeah because I don't have any experience with those. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, this is uh, from one of our members. Uh, Next question from Val Abapo. Thank you, Eric, for sharing a very helpful topic. The, my question, his question is, how much does remote observatories usually charge per hour? Well, I, I noticed also that you mentioned that in the one of the rent for uh, observatories for rent, like there's one in Chile. So yes. that would be very interesting. So in, in general, how much do they charge? Is it, uh, uh, um, is it affordable yeah, it, for private persons? Yeah. It varies. Um... I would well, but it, no, no, it it varies. But the rule of thumb that I kind of think of is more or less one U.S. dollar per minute, or 
So six wow. or so maybe about 60 US dollars per hour or sometimes 100 US dollars per hour. And um, yeah, I don't know how many actually will allow for charging per hour. In fact, I think some of them actually, it's, it's kind of like they go by points and it's usually a dollar a point and the point translates to a minute. Um, but then depending on on when you use those points, it can actually be more than a minute. In other words, so so let's say you you might buy a hundred points, but if you use if you use those points during uh, a full moon, it could be as it could be as as uh, inexpensive as two two points per I know two minutes per point instead of one minute per point, something along those lines. They 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 have their each each business has their own model, but so you can probably just plan on one U.S. dollar per minute. And how do you how do they usually time this? Uh, or like uh, the the telescope is already pointing to the object, or and you time you when yeah. you start taking pictures or something like that? Yeah, I think I think they the the um, the time charge I believe is for time actually spent gathering data. So I I, I believe flats and darks are are I think they take care of taking of the flats and darks for you. Again, it it, it really depends on the on the business. Some, yeah, but I think most of them are pretty generous in that you're only charged for actual minutes of lights. So again, so flats, darks, bias frames are are not charged, and um, because they can be they can be taken offline. And I mean during during daytime hours for some of those exposures. Um, just trying to remember what else they, what else they might charge for, and like like but like I mentioned, um, some there are some that there are some services where you actually use the telescope or actually operate the telescope there's somewhere you just say give me the data so uh actually the, the, there are no more questions here but sonic Turan says thank you so much and june and Brida also says thank you eric my pleasure uh, yeah it's interesting uh the remote observatory said have are do you know of uh, academic institutions for example or yeah, for, for those who, who would want to do some studies, uh, do they avail of these remote observatories for rent? Yeah. Actually, now, now that that triggers something, I, I'm aware of something called S-L-O-O-H. Um, what is it? I forget what's, what that stands for, but and, and I actually, they might actually cater to academic institutions. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. I forget what exactly what it what it stands for. I mean, I'm just I just did a quick Google search right now, but uh, but yeah, they're actually they uh, they're actually geared for for astronomers or sorry for students. So they're, they're actually for students. Um, and um, I also I also know of one of the well, one of the early gurus of CCD imaging uh, was Ron Wodowski, and. Um, and he, I know he, he's now operating or is the director of, of an, another remote observatory, the Desek Mount Foundation, which is also um, um, aimed for, for um, educators. So if you're an educator or a student, you actually, I forgot to mention this, but, but yeah, for educators and students should have access to remote observatories for free or he for heavy discounts. So there is that other avenue for, for um, remote observing. So yeah, so S L O O H, and then um, I'll just I'll just type this in the chat now to the Tezek Mount Foundation. Yeah, I'm not even so sure how you pronounce that. It's some Mayan term, but but yeah, I I just sent it to you. Um, uh, well, yeah. let's see. I just sent it. Let me send it to everybody. Thank you. For example, maybe the RTU students. Uh, can avail of this uh, possibly yeah. yeah and then uh yeah I think I astronomy that. students yeah yes and um and yeah here's the slow slew however you want to pronounce that i hope everyone can see that is it in the chat it's in the chat but it just says to hosts and panelists so oh, okay. yeah so i'm not so sure how we can share that with the, with the general audience but anyway well we'll uh We'll uh, share it later. Okay. Yeah. See if I can find the website for the Desert Moon Foundation. Um, well, they have a they have a blog. 
<laughs> it's a start. Thank you. Feel free to share that with with um, with the audience. T Z E T Z E C. Yeah. M A U N Foundation. Yes. T Z E C. M A U N Foundation. Yeah. They can search it in Google. Uh, yes. www.slooh.com. Yes. And https T Z E C M A U N dot WordPress dot com slash yes. sign dash up. Okay. Anyway, well, uh, yeah, it it is in the chat. You can uh, uh, just uh, repeat that later. Uh, okay. Okay. Do we have other questions? Uh, because uh, there, I think there are no more questions in the Q and A. May I ask our panelists if uh, you want to ask questions to Eric? Yeah, I have one. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Okay, so uh, hi, Eric. Hi. Hello. Yes, hi, Eric. And uh, yeah, before I uh, mention my question, I'd like to thank you for sharing your experience on remote imaging. And of course, uh, uh, to Experimental expertise on uh, this topic on EQ mod. So here's imaging such as uh, there is an eclipse and you paid to use a, a remote telescope for the event and suddenly the telescope uh, the telescope bugged down from from there and do you get a refund or how do they compensate for this? Let's see. Um, yeah, that's a good question, especially for the for the let's see for the. Um, Hourly rental sites, they yeah, I, I believe any any lost you, you don't you don't get charged for any lost data. For those that you that you rent on a monthly basis, when you actually send your telescopes down for for that, yeah, there's no for well in our case, yeah, if if our if it was our equipment that failed and we needed well if we needed their help, um, and they they're able to fix it. They, so any any service that they that they um, perform, well, they, again, depends on the nature of the business. It would either be um, that there, for some of the sites they might offer so many hours of support, but beyond beyond that that fixed number of hours of support, then you we might we may need to pay for them on an hourly basis. Uh, there were in there are other cases where um, where they they are not able to, to uh, perform any any help for us. And again, that's where. That's where oh boo hoo! I have to travel to a dark site and and see some really nice dark skies. So um, so how is this a burden? But anyway, bottom line is there have been cases where we're just unable to to image and yeah we have to we have to travel and perform the service ourselves. So again, it depends on the nature of the business and the the, the help available. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, there's a comment here from Norman uh, regarding the other sites, uh, like for example that you mentioned, or uh, other remote observatories mm -hmm. is the Skynet Robotic Telescope Network. Are you familiar Skynet. with that? The Skynet, Skynet Robotic Telescope Network. Hmm. I, I can't say I've heard of these. Skynet <laughs> Robotic Telescope ah, Network. This is yeah. news to me. <laughs> uh, from Norman. Uh, yeah, this is well. Hey, yeah. As long as they're as long as, as long as they're not building terminators. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they got the name from there. Yeah. Any I'm other? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Any other yeah. questions from? Yeah. Yes. Were you able to access it, Skynet? Yeah, I see. I see the website. Yeah. Um, it's by UNC. This is North Carolina, maybe. But yeah, this is yeah, this 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 actually looks pretty pretty neat. Okay. What do they what do they offer? Um let's see, looks like Green Bank 20. Really? Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. It looks like maybe they are different. Looks like they maybe they're they're set up across different observatories. Okay, I even see Yerkes listed here. Mm -hmm. they, yeah, they, so they, they have a network. They have a network yes. of uh, professional observatories or something. Yes, like that's that? what it looks like. Yes, okay. I mean, okay. I'm not so sure uh, how. Uh, yeah, again, this is this is news to me, so I I'm not so sure how this works. 
maybe these are professional uh, academic observatories, something like yeah. that. Yeah, but um, yeah. well, if professional just means pay us and we'll help you, sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. From the oh, yeah, Edwin, yeah. Uh, Norman, oh, Norman, yeah, Norman first. Norman, yeah. Norman. Yeah, it's basically a network supported by the National Science Foundation. So they uh, basically utilize various robotic telescope uh, systems in different observatories. So can, can you. students can students avail of that? Yes, they uh, they have to log in for an account. Unlike uh, because sometimes uh, when when for the students they usually go for the telescopes where they have to uh, petition for telescope time for uh, particular targets for their research yeah. but this one is more on uh, it's a bit general use oh thank you thank you norman edwin yes uh, hi eric uh, thank you for a very uh, interesting uh, presentation My pleasure. Uh, I have, yeah i have a, uh, a comment quick comment and a couple of practical questions. So sure. my comment is uh, remote observatories are also useful, not just for imaging from a dark sky site, but also for, uh, for example, uh, confirming a discovery. For example, you're imaging from on the East Coast and you found a you know suspicious object, could be a new comet. You could use your observatory on the West Coast to confirm it because it's still nighttime there and point, it's yes. on your location. So uh, it's good for con confirming uh, any potential discoveries also. So not just for imaging. So just wanted to add that. And uh, my comments, I mean, my two questions is uh, the first one, uh, Eric, is during the day, your observatory is closed. Yes. And my question is how... How do you control heat and humidity inside the observatory? Yeah. And if it gets cold or humid, uh, do you have a dew heater on your telescope? Okay, uh, let's see. The the, the roll off roof was not uh, yeah that was not climate controlled, but um, at at one point uh, this was this was kind of like a. Um, like I had mentioned that that we there were other observers or observatories in the area and some of them had had um, some of them had um, weather stations and all and uh, we were kind of like also we had, we had our own Yahoo group where we also kind of discussed different options and yeah some of them actually did have air conditioning installed but um, what what we what we ended up doing uh, in fact I think we all ended up um, uh, with this solution, because in terms of cooling in the in the winter time, they're they're not it, it doesn't really matter. But in the summertime, yeah, heat might might be a concern. Um, there, uh, this, this was definitely something new I learned in that there's either these paints. I mean, just just yeah, just basically paint that uh, had a very high infrared reflectivity um, um, factor. I, I forget the exact term, but but basically we painted our we all painted our roofs that with this paint and it it made a huge difference in in controlling the heat um let's see um with um do yeah we do control yeah we actually i i did not we did not use do heaters in the, in that with that roll off roof and uh found out the hard way that, that that the desert can still get pretty humid at night but um but yeah we just we just we ended up just cleaning our lenses we just accepted the fact that it would get that they would get dirty and had to clean our optics every now and then. Um, but one thing we've also seen is that with a dome, that yeah, that when you're in a dome, I'm not quite so sure. Well, yeah, I don't, I, I haven't really looked into this, but do heaters are, are are less important in inside of a dome. There's something about the dynamics of of a telescope aimed out shoot or aiming out of the slit of a dome that makes do less of an issue. And the reason I raised the issue about uh, heat inside the observatory is because, uh, for example, if you have a clear night and you want to take advantage of that clear night, so you want to maximize your observing time, and how long does it usually take to cool down the telescope because before you can start imaging? 
So uh, okay, yes, that that's that's definitely a case. Let's see. Um, with the roll off roof, we opened about we would open the roof about maybe thirty minutes to an hour before um, observing. Or yeah, so so sometimes we we would, we would open the roof like um, just before dark, just before dark. At least that way, it's it's the sun's already low, and we 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 can allow the telescopes to acclimate. Plus, um, uh, with the, for the telescopes that had fans, we would turn the fans on, and then um, with our current the the our where we're, where we are currently situated, there's actually a fan inside the the dome also that we. We turn that on about an hour before we start shooting. Okay. Now the other question I had is uh, a, a practical question: How do you control, like, insect or rodent problem inside the observatory? Because you know, in, uh, spiders can can weave cobwebs in front of the optics, and uh, squirrels, for example, in our backyard observatory, a squirrel decided uh, to. Turn the observatory into a nest, so <laughs> so we had to clean yeah. that. And they can chew on cables, wires, and so forth. So how do you do? You have a problem like that at your observatory? Let's see. Um, with uh, with with our for the prior roll off. Uh, let's see. I remember I I I, uh, I, did, I had read about uh, some um, what's this again? Some some war stories. Like somebody had. Uh, Squirrels pack their paramounts with uh, with sunflower seeds. So um, so I, I think their solution, which I ended up copying, was I just got I just got um, steel wool, and I plugged up the holes of the paramount and then secured them with 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 tape so so they would they wouldn't get in. Bugs is a different question, that's for sure. That's again probably uh, that that what that had never become an issue. I mean, in other words, they well. It, it was an issue in that yeah we were seeing bugs in the in the roll off roof I mean we're talking wasps and uh, I think there were even black widows so um, again well local help helped a lot there they they took care of the bugs for us and then um, and I think we at one point we had I I don't know if they were termites or something but there was definitely something that seemed to be um, building some kind of a colony inside the 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 observatory, so we brought in an exterminator for that. Uh, let's see, but they never got into our optics, thank goodness, or at least, well, if they did get into our optics, we didn't see them, so that was a good thing. Uh, but that, let's see, but, and then uh, I think, I believe in them, in our current, where we're currently situated, um, I know they have they have some some um, rodent traps or, or rodent poison and bait outside the observatory, but but bugs, I'm not so sure what they use for controlling them. But that's a very valid point. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Sure. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the panelists? Eric, uh, I was just wondering. Uh, there's going to be a total solar eclipse in 2024. Any of these remote observatories within the path of totality? <laughs> there probably are, but I, I'd be yeah, very be useful, yeah. I would be very concerned about, uh, I mean, you, you want to be very, very careful to make sure that you well, really yeah. are set up for solar gazing with the, in a remote observatory. And no, I'm not planning on no. <laughs> observing the eclipse. Um, in fact, what's funny is, um, uh, well, I, I still use the sky for controlling our telescopes. And um, if you don't turn it off by default, if you if you point the telescope at the sun, you'll hear this this really annoying beep, and then this 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 uh, voice going sun sun sun, <laughs> and it just it just keep going and going and going. And in fact, there was one time just recently um, I was testing. I was testing uh, yeah, our, our, our remote observatory during the day, and I'm glad I, I, I'm glad the dome was closed because I remember slewing the telescope. And at one point, it started beeping and going sun. So I was like, I'm not slewing to the sun. It's like, oh, it passed the, the scope. I uh, happened to point to the sun oh so briefly. It's like, whoa! <laughs> I'm glad I had the dome closed. <laughs> Oh, that's why there are no there are seldom uh, seldom do we have remote solar observatories yes okay thank you uh sure. yes any other questions
Well, uh, thank you again, Eric. Thank you so much. Uh, My pleasure. Uh, that was uh, really very, very important, informative for all of us, and uh, hope we can make use of that. And maybe some of the listeners can can embark on a project on remote astrophotography. Yeah. And yeah, I, I had even and I had even considered the the whole student accessibility uh, aspect yeah. because yeah, I mean many many of there are many services like like the Skynet or or those that I've listed that that should be or should allow access to to students around the world. So yeah, I I really hope that any students or 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 um, educators can take advantage of these services. Yeah, and also the equipment is uh, there's a yes. like you mentioned there are changes in the equipment making it easier, much easier compared to twenty years ago. Yes, and maybe even less expensive. Yes. Oh, and I, I just wanted to say uh, for um, that you had mentioned the Chile scope. Uh, so yeah, so they're situated in Chile. Um, I remember seeing when they first advertised in, on cloudy nights. What they were one of, one of their draws actually was planetary imaging because I think that the year that they started business they I think was a, was a, um, one of the favorable oppositions of Mars so one of their draws was imaging Mars with Damien Peach as available as a tutor <laughs> so it's like yeah um, I unfortunately I didn't take advantage of it but but still so so they yeah, do okay. they do also offer besides deep sky imaging planetary imaging as well. Yeah, that's very interesting because in Cebu, with the excellent seeing conditions, yes, there, maybe actually, Chris Goh and yeah. uh, 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 the, the, Crisco's friend who had an observatory there, also uh, the, the the Japanese friend. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe that can be, be another way to start uh, with yeah, the planetary, a yeah, planetary yeah. observation, which can do it almost every night uh, mm -hmm. if the planet is available. Thank you. Sure. So. Thank you so much again. And if there are no more questions, uh, allow me to present you, Eric, with our ALP Certificate of Appreciation. Of course, you are also an ALP member. <laughs> and this certificate from, uh, from our society, the Astronomical League of the Philippines, reads as follows. And this Certificate of Appreciation is presented to Enrico Africa for his invaluable insights, experience, and expertise. Shared the we shared with the participants for the talk, Remote Astrophotography, held as part of the ALP Global Astronomy Month 2023 program given this 15th of April, 2023, signed by James Kevin T. President and yours truly, Jose Francisco Aguilar, Vice President. Thank, Thank you, you, Eric. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we, we proceed, uh, uh, James, can we take a group picture again with Eric? Okay, ready? One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Thank you. Nice. Dada, Dada, hello, Dada. Well done. <laughs> and uh, before I proceed, James, can you mention the, the planned uh, 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 Global Astronomy Month Observer, observer activities? Yeah, the uh, free telescope viewing, no? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, AIT was planning to have free, free telescope viewing dates, no? uh, weekends, uh, supposedly. But uh, fortunately, for tomorrow, uh, we have to cancel it. Uh, and not only for weather, but also for some uh, logistics. No? And uh, on the 23rd, which was supposed to be, to, will be held in SM by the Bay, uh, this will be reverted. Uh, we have to rescind this to Luneta for the 23rd, no? so uh, night time viewing from 6 uh, p.m. to 9 p.m. No? Uh, in Luneta because uh, SMBY suddenly has a big event on the 23rd, so uh, so we have to change that date. No? So and the uh, last but not the least, the April 30, which we have a uh, we will start at 3.30 to 5 p.m. for a solar viewing session. So we will set up a white light and a hydrogen alpha viewing for the public. Then uh, after one hour of rest, then 6 o'clock to probably 9 to 9.30, we will have another nighttime observing uh, session, which probably will be showing uh, planet Venus, uh, moon, 
and uh, some big, some bright big sky objects as well as some uh, double stars and bright stars. Uh, so far, that's tentatively our simple schedule for Global Astronomy Month. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Raymond and uh, Eric as well as uh, Norman who stayed the whole session. No? And I'd like to uh, thank you for your time as well as all the panelists. No? Uh, also to Jet, no? so, uh, I despite his uh, uh, very tight schedule, no? actually I'd like to apologize also uh, our pre-webinar, I got, I also got caught up, no? but uh, actually the webinar came out very successful no? and uh, I'd like to thank everyone for it. Thank you, James. Uh, I would just like to make some announcements before we end. Yeah. So before we conclude uh, today's webinar, I would like, of course, to thank all our attendees. Uh, uh, aside from our uh, presenters, uh, I would like to thank all our attendees for joining us. We will be sending your certificate of attendance for today's webinar by email to all registrants who were able to join us today. And we are so grateful to all our webinar speakers who were very generous to give their precious time to share their knowledge and expertise to the world amateur astronomer com community. We can never thank you enough. And uh, all our past webinars have all been recorded and the videos of the uh, of our Astronomy Expert series as well as this one uh, and, the, and our NAW uh, videos are posted uh, in our official ALP YouTube sh channel as shown here. So please, uh, if you were not, you, if you miss this, you can still watch them uh, of uh, in our YouTube official ALP YouTube channel. So I would like to announce our upcoming uh, talk again, online talk this April. So as part of our Astro ALP Astronomy Expert Series for 2023. Uh, we will have a, a, a talk on April 30, that is a Sunday, 9.30 a.m. Philippine Standard Time uh, and 9.30 a.m. p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, April 29, Saturday. Uh, so this is uh, the talk by Daniel Green, uh, PhD. He is the director of the International Astronomical Union Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams. Uh, he will talk on the topic, a brief tutorial on comets. So we will be, I will be posting, we will be posting the, the invitation uh, uh, for this web webinar, hopefully by tomorrow at our website and also at our social media page or Facebook page. So after April, uh, the next talk will be on May 20, Saturday, 8.30 p.m. Philippine Standard Time and 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So the talk will be by none other than uh, Dr. Deborah M. L. Green, uh, who has been with us before. She is the president of the International Astronomical Union and Professor Emeritus of Astronomy at the Vassar College of New York. And she will give a very interesting talk of uh, entitled A Glimpse of Galaxies at the Dawn of the Universe. We will be also be posting the, the uh, webinar invitation in our social media page and in our web page. So these are all free webinars, uh, just like our all of our webinars. So please register uh, once we post the links to the uh, registration. So thank you everyone uh, for attending. Uh, take care everyone, uh, clear skies. And for our organizers, uh, I will send the Zoom link for our post webinar meeting. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank, you. Bye. thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Oh, okay.